So we are continuing our, our Vision 2020. I mean, it's a big part of the reason why we are here right now. Um, so this is our new home at our new time. Uh, well, here we are, Trinity Del Rey, 1030, and, and we've got Kingdom Kids happening where the, the two churches are combining um, in, in that ministry, and we've got lots of awesome stuff going on with our youth, and all over the place, it just feels like God is on the move. And we are in an era of redemptive history that is radically exciting. Because, you know, there was one time when you didn't need to have a movement called Church United, it just was. Did you know that? Like, if you go all the way back to Acts 2, and you see Pentecost and the Holy Spirit given in the church birth, it was just the people of God, and they were on mission, and they were hospitable, and they were, had great expectation in the Holy Spirit, and they were empowering new leaders as new people got saved, and, and, and they continued to invite those around them, and, and there was like one thing. So it didn't need to be a movement, it just was. And then over time, you know, there's, there's been a ways where we've gotten a bit away from that. But right now, in this time, in redemptive history, God's Holy Spirit is doing this thing where he's bringing us back in really sweet and beautiful ways where we are holding loosely our differences and our distinctives and we are holding on with all that we can to the person and work of Jesus Christ together. Because we believe that Jesus' prayers are going to be answered. John 17, Jesus prays and he's like, Father, all of those who are going to believe in me, I pray that they would become what? One. And we are getting to be a part of that answered prayer. And when Jesus' prayers start getting answered, it is like an amazing time to be a part of church history. And so I just, I just want to catch that moment for you, bring you up to speed. That's what's happening. Now, the, the, the Church United movement that's happening here in South Florida, they have a vision. It's called Vision 2023, where they're looking to see the amount of Christ followers doubled in South Florida. The registered amount of Christ followers, so when I say registered, I'm talking about like Barna did a survey and asked some questions and interviewed a ton of people. And he found that, well, according to reports and research that went out, I don't think it was just Barna, it was probably different groups as well, that in South Florida there were 3% of those who were, who were Christians who were born again, Jesus is the only way, Bible is the word of God type stuff. There were 3% who identified as that. And what Church United believes is not to see churches come together just to feel good about themselves, but they believe that as churches come together, there's going to be like an amazing and extravagant gospel compelling to the onlooking world as they see that. What that means is a ton of people are going to get saved if churches are obedient. And, and so that's what we're doing. We're just trying to do the next right thing in that. And so for us, we're looking at this thing, and we're, we said, okay, Vision 2023, that's like four or five years out. We want to do something that we can get our hands around and be a part of that. So for the next two years, we have this, this vision called Vision 2020. And we're saying, for us, in, in our context, if we're going to see the amount of Christ followers doubled, well, one of the metrics for that is baptism. And so we just said, well, we, we normally baptize about 50 people a year. We just, we're just believing God to see that double. And so over the next two years, we're believing for and, we're, we're, and we're, we're putting our lives sort of on the line, if you will, for the fact that God's Spirit is going to come in a special and unique way, in a way that it actually hasn't been among us to this point in our history. And we're going to see the amount of baptisms doubled. That's just what we're believing for and we're, we're yearning for. It. We're, we're all in as it comes to this Vision 2020. And that's really the, simple, the simplest way of, of describing it and is seeing the amount of people who, who come to faith double in, in the next two years. And so part of this move to come here is not only trying to be obedient to what we believe God is doing, but in line with that, believing that because of the unity that Jesus prayed for, like that seems to be his greatest evangelistic strategy. Better than any track or door-to-door, -door, even relational training, is this strategy that he gives the church that if you fall in love with one another and start acting like the family that I've created you to be, people will know and see and come. And that's what we're believing for. And so today's a really special day. Because not only are we here, and we're already beginning to see some of the fruit of that, we are going to get to baptize several individuals who have been coming to this church. They're, they're a part of different things outside of this church, but have connection here. And, and they're saying, like, the Jesus that, that they talk about has now become our Jesus, and we want to give our lives to that. And so we thought it was a great way to kind of start our, our journey here at, at Trinity Del Rey 
by marking it with baptism. So we're super excited about that, and we hope to see you in a few minutes, actually. As we continue our Vision 2020, we've, we've said that you, we're going to need a different culture for us here at the Avenue Church. We have a really cool culture. There's some really awesome things about us, but for us to actually see this sort of shift from being um, sort of what we've always been to something uh, th that would resemble the greater works that Jesus promised we would do, we, we would need to have a different type of culture. And so we identify that there's, there's sort of four streams to this culture where we're going to need to see change. The first one that we walked through uh, had to deal with the Holy Spirit and just this idea of uh, having greater expectations. If you ever see any of our social media, hashtag greater expectations, that's what Vision 2020 is. We're expecting more because we're believing that God's Holy Spirit wants to do more than he's ever done in our midst. And so we're believing upon his Holy Spirit and not our strategy. So we preached weeks on the Holy Spirit in greater expectation. And then we just finished a series called Greater Hospitality. Because when we looked at the early church, we saw like radical hospitality. And so we said, hey, what does it look like for us to engage in some hospitality that maybe we've never done before? What does the, the God of hospitality desire from us? And now we're going to begin a journey um, of empowerment, of empowerment. And, and we're going to look at the, the God who empowers and what the implications of gospel empowerment are for us as a community. Because if we're going to see the amount of people who give their lives to Christ, who respond to the gospel double, then we're going to have to see new leaders taking the gospel to new places that it's never been before. Like in our, in our midst. I'm not talking about over there, over there. I'm talking about like in the, the places and the margins and the communities of Delray where the gospel hasn't had a faithful presence or it hasn't, hasn't appeared in, in the particular manifestation that we believe the new leaders can, can see it appear. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to be in 2 Timothy, and this is going to be, uh, uh, basically we're reading through it verse by verse, and we're going to look at, from a gospel perspective, what can we learn about empowerment as we travel through the book of 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be. And uh, we're just going to take it, like I said, we're going to do a section at a time, and we're going to be in this for about, I think, seven to eight weeks. And we're just going to be walking ourselves through the book of 2 Timothy. So if you love the scriptures, and you, and you love to kind of come prepared for today, and you're not just expecting to kind of be entertained, but you're expecting to encounter God, then I would encourage you to get as much information, background stuff on 2 Timothy as you can. Research it, do your homework, so that when we come together, we're actually, our hearts are kind of prepared for this, as opposed to always kind of having to do catch-up work. So um, 2 Timothy, it's right after 1 Timothy in, your, in the New Testament. It's a Bible joke, so sorry. Um, I taught Bible for a long time to 7th graders, so, you know, you got to kind of try to keep it, keep it fresh. Hey, let's talk a little bit about the shift that we need to see here in this greater culture. So for us, um, we need to see a shift as it pertains to empowerment. The shift for us is from ownership to empowerment. Check this out with me. From ownership to empowerment. One of the things that we do really well here at the AC is ownership. Like if you have somebody who's, who's functioning in a ministry, they own it. They bleed for it. They, are, they like give themselves to it. And that's a great, great start. But that's not where we can finish. If, if we're going to see the gospel go beyond these walls and even beyond this city, we have to shift in our culture from being a culture who has great owners of particular ministries or particular areas to those who learn to empower others to do the same. Ownership being shifted into empowerment, into those who, who give it away in such a way that those they give it to can actually flourish. This isn't just saying, well, I don't want to do that anymore, so now you do it. This is me saying, you come with me, and, and, and we'll do together. You'll watch me, and then, and, then, and then we'll do together, and then I'll watch you, and then, and then you'll take it, and you'll see it flourish in your own perspective and potential in the Holy Spirit. From ownership to empowerment. And so... Um, just to give you a working definition of empowerment, I think we have it here in the next slide. Empowerment, the process, uh, this is from Cam Cambridge Dictionary, the, the process of gaining freedom and power to do what you want. There was a couple of different definitions. I like this one. The process of gaining freedom and power to do what you want. 
All right, let's just break this down a minute here. Now, this isn't the Word of God, but this is a concept that's going to help us throughout the next <coughs> several weeks. And so, first of all, we're going we're gonna to begin to understand that empowerment is a, say it with me, process. Process. Yeah, I love that you're closer to me. Can I just say that? Because at Atlantic, it was like, <laughs> it was like hard to see you. It had the orchestra pit. I don't even know what that is. But like now, it's like we're together. We're doing this together. Okay, I just wanted to catch that moment. The process. The pro so this is not something that's going to happen quick. When, when we're thinking about empowering others, by the way, disclaimer, this isn't about self-empowerment. Because we're going to see the gospel is always about giving it away. But you can't give away what you don't have. And so, so this is a process. This is a journey that we're taking others on. So it's not quick. There's no awesome system. I like systems because they're quick and I know when I'm done. When it, when it comes to empowerment, there's no easy and, and non-messy, like, silver bullet. It is a process of us giving over something to someone. What are we giving over? Well, the process of gaining freedom and power. I love those two words because um, I'm sure there's many words that will des des could describe the gospel message that we believe, but those two are some of my favorite. See, the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, is that he came to do this. I don't know how you share the gospel. Maybe it's like, man, you, you, you got a lot of shame and guilt, and Christ died for your sins so that the Father, although he should punish you, has punished Christ. And, and, if, and, and if you believe that, if you turn from your sin and believe that Christ paid for it and overcame it through his death and resurrection, you can be forgiven. That is the gospel, and that is true, and that is true for those of you who are in here who, who brought in some shame and guilt, maybe you've been owned by it for a while, then I invite you to believe that perspective of the gospel. But that is not the only perspective of the gospel. That is not all Jesus came to do because a lot of us can be forgiven of our sin and have eternal life and yet live this life with no freedom and no power to make any changes. Are you with me? Okay, cool. Because now when I ask, I, you got to respond because you're like right there. And I know your names. I'm like, what's up, Chris? How are you doing? Hi, Danelia. You guys are getting married soon. It's awesome. I'm, this is going to happen. I'm sorry a little bit because I can see you like we're together. All right. The process of gaining freedom and power. So the gospel is not just the gospel of forgiveness, although we can't take that away. We can't just run to freedom and power if you're still caught in your sin. You can't make God a God who doesn't care about sin and all he cares about is sin. No, no. See, only if you are forgiven of your sin, only if the penalty of your sin is removed, and now you can have access and a relationship to God both now and forever, can you actually experience these two things. But the gospel goes beyond forgiveness, and it promises both freedom and power. Freedom and power. Freedom to, to no longer be enslaved to the things that once enslaved you. So when I got saved, I was like super fearful, even though I didn't know it. After I got saved, I was still fearful, but I began to be able to name my fear. And once you can start naming something, it doesn't have as much power over you. And as I've walked in the process of those people around me, like I'm going to talk about one person in particular here in just a minute, what they've done is they have given their lives to help me to understand this and this more so that now that I'm 44 and I'm walked with Jesus for 20 plus years, I still have struggles. I still have backward behavior that show up, but I have a lot more freedom and power over my fear and anxiety than I ever have before. Praise Jesus. That's what the gospel does. That's, that's the guy. It frees us and it gives us power. That's just on a personal level. Check this out. It does that for us as a church as well. We get freed and empowered, not just as an individual, but as the people of God, to no longer be consumed with the kingdom of the Avenue Church and how well we're doing, but with the kingdom of God and how it has given us power to enter into the social injustices, how it has given us power to enter into racism, inequality, how it has given us power to enter into the homeless or the orphan or the widow's world and begin to bring the same freedom and power that we have. 
Do you understand this isn't just an individual thing? This is a corporate thing. This is how God is rescuing and renewing all of creation to do what you want. Now, some of you read that, and you might be like, well, wait a minute. This is, that, that brings it back to self. Well, check this out. Watch this. <clears throat> When, when I first got saved, I still wanted to do what my old self wanted to do. But, but over here, I actually want to do what God wants me to do. I just can't pull it off all the time. But if, if I had my way, I would obediently be following Jesus Christ and experiencing the fullness of his joy. So check it out. As I receive more and more empowerment, I actually get to do what I want because what I want are the things that God wants. Are you with me on that? And the same is true for you guys. So, so as you are more and more empowered, and as you empower people, you're simply allowing them to do what their new hearts actually want to do, but don't have the freedom and power to do so. All right, cool. This is going to be way more interactive than you might be comfortable with. I'm sorry, but you're right there. I love it. Okay. Keep going, Casey. Got to baptize people soon. All right. Let's see what time we got. Oh, yeah. We're okay. So what's the word I'm looking for to describe somebody who has been on this process and is probably ready to give it away? It might not be a word you're expecting. Let's just throw it up. Let's see the next slide. Disruptive. Disruptive. If I have my way, listen, if I have my way with the four children that call me daddy, one of the greatest accomplishments I will be able to rest with as a father is if I send out four radically disruptive children. I would love to be a part of the rearing and sending and loving of four disruptive children of God. It would do my heart great joy if I get the opportunity to bring my walker in this gym, I'll come on up here, I'm sitting somewhere. I love the bleachers. That's where I was worshiping. So I'd probably be like clunk, 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 up in the bleachers. <laughs> and not just my children, but the, the children, which are actually my children and kingdom kids beyond the four. And just watch as they disrupt the religious and as they disrupt illness and cancer and addiction, and as they disrupt racism and unhealthy marriages, and as they disrupt apathy and unbelief. <laughs> I'll sit in the back and I'll be like, man, I shot my arrows. I took them out of my quiver. I got to train them, and look at how they're piercing the darkness. Man, you are disruptive. Let's not forget, as we are in this process of empowering others, when you're disruptive over here, the church that's centered on the gospel is going to celebrate you. Not everybody, by the way. When you're disruptive as like an eight-year-old, it doesn't always go so well. Don't forget what the target is. The target is not compliance because our hearts will wander back to the compliance of the world because it's much easier than the compliance of the gospel. The target is children and those we are discipling and empowering to be so in love with Jesus that they're willing to risk it all every day to disrupt the systems that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. All right, let's check this out. Second Timothy. I'm going to read the verses together, and we'll go back and walk through them. The two main characters that you should know, if you don't know, uh, Paul is an apostle, which means that he's been one who's been sent by God on specific gospel ministry. He used to be Saul and persecute the church, and now he loves the church, and he's a part of building it. And he's going to be working with this guy named Timothy. And Timothy uh, was somebody that he was empowering. So you have the person who's doing the empowering, and you have the person who's receiving the empowering. Much of this sermon series will be, will be sort of targeted to Paul's as we look at elements of what it looks like to empower others. But that doesn't mean if you're a Timothy, if you're new to the faith and you're young to the faith, if, if you're part of the crew that's being baptized today, it's also to you because these are the people that you should be looking for and this is the posture that you should have toward those people. Paul and Timothy. 
we're going to be checking out today some of the elements of an empowering relationship. Let's, let's read the scriptures here. Paul, an apostle of uh, Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This right here is the word of God. It's our authority. It's where we base our teaching, our foundation, our life. And so in this uh, particular passage, um, what we're going to see is, uh, uh, um, as we make application, a few elements to empowering relationships. So, so kind of, uh, w- what as we look at this particular scripture, can we now begin to see um, we might want to receive from a Paul, or we might want to give uh, to a Timothy? Remember, remember what's at stake, right? I tried to catch the moment for you of God being on the move and seeing this great revival break out in the South Florida area, and I believe beyond, but I know that it's happening here. And so as we have this context of lost people getting saved, of people coming to know the freedom and the power that is in Christ Jesus, it's not going to happen outside of us empowering and sending new people, because what's already happening is with the people that are out there. So if you're out there, and you're sharing the gospel, and you're living on mission for Christ, awesome! But we're going to get what we're going to get. And we're talking about doubling. And so you've got to do something different if you want a different result. And so we, what are some of the elements of empowering relationships? Well, before we kind of move into application, there were, there were three things. If you have your Bibles, man, it would be awesome to underline or circle these sort of three things. And if not, you know, just kind of highlight them in your, in your sort of electronic Bible that you're looking at in your phone. But however you want to do it, say a quick hello to our online community. Where are we filming? There they are. We always want to say hello. Thanks for being with us. So hopefully you guys have a Bible around. You guys all have a uh, outline that, that you can follow along as well. So, so you'll see these, uh, I believe, yeah, I believe you'll see these in your outline about halfway through. Um, th- these, are, these are some things to the passage that uh, are going to be key for us to understanding how can you make that application, okay? So we just don't want to jump to application. We actually want to see what the scriptures uh, have to say about that, um, under, under, under the sort of the, our first key idea, I love, I love here how, how Paul writes, to Timothy, my beloved child. My beloved child. I, I wrote that this morning, and I was in subculture in the corner, and I, I just I had some worship on. One of the things I was thinking about this morning was I couldn't wait to get here to worship with you guys because it just looks so weird when I'm drinking my coffee in the corner, like worshiping Jesus. I mean, I know I should be bold. Like, I'm totally down with that. But I'm also, I got like the weird factor happening. And so I was like, man, I had the wor- my worship on. I was reading the word of God. And I was just like, I had my hands under. I'm like, and I start crying. I was like, I, you know, nobody came over to me to check on me. So whatever. I mean, it must not have crushed the, 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 the weirdness threshold too much. But... <laughs> I was like waiting to get with you guys so we could worship together. But there was one thing that really kind of captured my heart in, in, some, in some of these moments this morning, and it was this idea of the beloved child. Here's the deal. If you are in Christ, what that means is that you are now a beloved child, son or daughter of the Father. And it means that he has chosen to set his affection on you outside of anything you have done or ever will do. You can't earn it. You can't keep it. It's yours to enjoy and then give away. Okay, so so let's 
that's what you are. You are a beloved child. But here's the deal, and this is what I was realizing. It's really hard for us to get our mind around that unless we are able to somehow taste that in person. It's like a really awesome gospel concept, and the Holy Spirit helps us, but unless somebody helps you to experience that, like this side of heaven, it's a concept that can remain like almost out there for us. And if this concept remains out there for us, then what's going to be up in here is fear, no freedom, and no self-control, which we're going to see in just a second. And so, and so I, as I was reading that, I was thinking, man, it's true, but it's awesome how God uses people to make his truths come alive in other people. And this is a fundamental truth that we oftentimes miss because of the brokenness from which we come. Let me explain. It's true of us in Christ, but if you come from a home where you did not have a parental situation that made you feel as though you were a beloved child, this can be a really difficult concept to grasp. It's like, yeah, but my dad bounced when I was three, or, or my mom was always angry at me, or I could never seem to, like, settle the discord in my own heart to think my parents thought well of me, or I was always trying to earn or prove, or I was lost, or I was up and down, or my mom was in addiction, or what, like, whatever. Like, there's a whole host of reasons as to why this might be a really difficult concept for you. And so what I love about the gospel family is that you don't, have to have experienced this in your biological family for you to experience this, this side of heaven. Because although Timothy seemed to have an awesome family experience, although we don't know much about his dad, he's not mentioned in those who are followers of Jesus Christ. We know that he comes from a solid family with his mom and his, his grandma. But we see Paul stepping in and acting as that parental figure to reinforce that Timothy was indeed a beloved son. Because if he was beloved to Paul, it would give him a good mental picture and experience of what it meant to be beloved to the father. Are you with me on that so far? Sometimes my wife says, I talk too fast and I keep going too, too strong. So I'm just going to let that settle for a second. She's not here right now, so. <laughs> she might be watching online. Hey, baby. I got a lot more to say, so let's pace it. Oftentimes, God will use another person to help you experience what is true in the gospel. And if you didn't get that in your own family, then, then like, the need for that increases dramatically when you get saved as an adult and you're trying to now figure out life as a beloved child. Listen, reality check. I feel like uh, we have a church that has a high need of that. I don't know everyone's family situation, but I know enough to know that we need the Pauls in this community to step up and be the Pauls to the many Timothys who might be looking for that. And then I thought, not only is that a need if you've never experienced it, but even if you have, one of the most impactful experiences that I've walked through as a Christian is having somebody outside my family do this for me. I had an awesome family. My dad's right there. My mom's with my wife. I had a volleyball tournament. They were over there. But I, had, I had a great, great family experience. It was awesome, and I felt like a beloved child. It wasn't perfect. There was brokenness, of course, but... but I, I got to experience a lot of this. And let me tell you, even though I experienced a lot of this in the home that I grew up, one of the most powerful and life-changing experiences is that God gave me somebody outside my family to play this role for me as well. His name is Dan Myers, and he's a pastor at Spanish River Church. And I have experienced what it means to be a beloved child because of the gospel, because of my family of origin, and because of the family of God, one person outside of my biological family helping me to experience what is already true of me. And because of that, that's why I can stand here and tell you that I've experienced like some awesome, pretty radical change as it pertains to my fear and insecurity in the gospel. Outside of him, I'm probably still in the bondage over here where I kind of limp through life, and I don't experience all that God has for me. 
Secondly, fan into flame. I love Timothy. I love him because he's my, I got two guys in the scriptures. Okay, besides Jesus, like he's, he's the guy. But I got two guys in the scriptures, right? I got David. David's one of my guys. So uh, in the Old Testament, he's, he's my best friend in the Old Testament. I love David because he knew the darkness of the soul, and it makes me feel okay when the darkness of the soul rolls onto me. It's like, that's my guy, and if he could still love the Father like that, and he could still be honest and open and write about it, then I guess I can too. And then my guy in the New Testament, man, I love Timothy because it was obvious that Timothy struggled with fear because there are, in the two letters that are written to Timothy, there are 25 times that Paul encourages Timothy to quit being a wuss. It's much kinder that way. I mean, it doesn't come out that way. I mean, beloved child, you know, all those sort of things. 25 times in two letters, Paul is like, if you've got fear, it's not from God. If you've got a gift, fan it into flame because it looks like you've let your fear sort of creep in and now you're not running at 100% anymore. 25 times Paul encourages Timothy. So I love Timothy because it reminds me that although I'm a different dude, I can still walk through the struggles that I had as long as I've got my Paul to keep me going and keep me disruptive. Finally, fan into flame. Fan into flame. Here's what that means. Like, Timothy had gifts. He had the gift of the Holy Spirit, but he had, he had other gifts. He had, he had things about him that God had divinely set upon him, upon his new birth, that would bless not only him, but the lost and the church. And, and here's what Paul is saying. Even though you have those gifts, there's a potential for them to lie dormant if you, if you move back in your fear. You've got to do whatever you can to fan into flame the gifts that God has given you. You've got to give your life to keeping those gifts. The word in the Greek means kept afresh or in full flame. You've got to continue to inflame yourself for Jesus so that you no longer give over to your fear or whatever it might be for you, but rather you walk in the full disruption that God has called you to walk. He ends the passage, at least in this particular portion, by saying, um, so, so this, this fear, for God gave us not a spirit of fear. So if, you, if, if there's fear and it's creeping up, Allison, Allison Hicks always says fear is a liar. It's not from God. If, you, if you're operating out of fear, that's not gospel motivation. Fear is, it, for God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Power and love and self-control. When, that, when, those, when those things begin to dominate you then, you, then then you're walking in the full disruption that God's called you to walk in. And Paul thought it was his job to bring those things out in Timothy. So my question to you is, who are you bringing out power, love, and self-control from? Who you got? Who, who, who is it that you are giving yourselves to and defining your success by their success? Here are some of the elements of empowering relationships. This is, what, this is what it would look like. So you might know whether you have them or not. Check this out. Um, they're not going to, yeah, they are listed. Yeah, so go to the first one. Time. You can't empower somebody without allowing there to be time in that relationship. We said that this was a process, right? So you, you have to find yourself in a committed relationship to one, two, three other people. I mean, you can't do this for 20 people. Paul didn't have 20 Timothys. He had one Timothy and maybe a few others, but, but like there was, there was some choice and purpose to this because it would take so much time. If, you're going, if we're going to see other people, Paul's, listen to me, if we're going to see other people empowered amongst us, we might just have to reorient some of our schedules because it's not just time randomly. Go to the next one. Please. Proximity. That was rude. Sorry. I just snapped that off. Sorry, Richard. I love Richard. Can we give it up for Richard right there? Doing slides. Yeah. I can't usually see him, so he's like the Wizard of Oz normally, but there he is. He, he's, he lives. He's real. It's not just time. It's also proximity. It's also proximity. So, like, you got to bring people close. Like, I'm not just talking about at Starbucks over an awesome curriculum. I love that. I'm talking about like around your kids, in your marriage, 
watching hoops, doing this, doing that. Like, you've got to invite people in. I've been working with this one guy. His name's Glennon, right? And I, working with him doesn't, doesn't sound right. I've just been trying to do what Dan did for me to Glennon. And, and one of the things is we can't, it's like so hard with the, my, I got kids everywhere. And, 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 and so I pick one of them up at noon on Friday. And that's like when we meet. And so we've been meeting at, this is crazy. We've been meeting at Chick-fil-A. Where, and, I, and I try to like, you know, I, you know the Chick-fil-A like scene, right? So you've got the playground, so you might get 13 minutes of adult time. It's the best, right? You're like, go play. I know it's not super sanitary. No problem. We'll wipe you off with those little wipes, but I'm going to get a little bit of time over here. And so Glenn and I have been meeting at Chick-fil-A. We don't, you know, what's, you know what our curriculum has been over the, like, the last year? It's been life. We've just let life be the curriculum, and, and I've, tried to, I've tried to call out power. I've tried to call out love. I've tried to call out self-control in Glennon, but I've had to do it in a really messy situation, and, and sometimes that doesn't always seem awesome to me because I love the coffee meeting because it's neat. It's in my world. I can control it. Nobody asked me to go to the bathroom in subculture. <laughs> Nobody gets in a fight that I am related to next to me in Starbucks. Nobody has to go to the bathroom twice because they didn't go the first time. It's like, I'm with you. And, and sometimes I'm like, man, I'm not, you know, you can, you can doubt, like, is this good? Is this a waste of time? I mean, I'm kind of like, deal, oh, Glenn, can you watch him? Because i got to take her because sometimes Cora comes with it. And it just, it's just super messy. And did we do anything? Did we get to anything? And then I'm reminded that, man, Dan, a lot of the time that I spent with Dan, we'd go to like a ball game. Or we'd go to a movie. We, he just let me into his life. And I got to see his marriage, and I got to see the way he raised his kids, and I got to see that the gospel meant more to him than just a curriculum. So if we're going to empower other people, we not, we not only need to have time, we need to have proximity. We've got to bring him in. What's the next one, please? Affection. Don't ever, <laughs> don't ever do this if you're not willing to fall in love for the, with the people that you're doing it with. Don't do it. Just do something else. This is so huge. I have felt so much affection from a man that is not in my family. He has wrapped his arms around me. He has listened to me. He is, he is for me. I have felt the affection of my heavenly father through him. And I know what it is to be loved by God because of affection of another. We must be willing to fall in love and have our hearts broken if we're going to do this well. Next one, please. Vulnerability. One of the, one of the key elements of an empowering relationship is the fact that you don't have it all together. Because I can remember my dad telling me at one point, he's like, there are some preachers who you really respect and admire from afar, and there are other preachers who you think, I can do that. They're as messed up as me. Just love Jesus. Something to that effect. And when I look at the people who have poured into me and the fact that I've been invited in not only to their homes but also to their weaknesses, then it makes much of Jesus. And, and our bond becomes much more about Jesus and much less about how well he or I are doing. What's the next one, please? Intentionality. This doesn't happen by accident. Like, you're, you're not going to, and I'm not going to ask for hands right now, my wife just texted me. That's funny. I wonder if she's watching. Should I check it? <laughs> You're saying yes. <laughs> no, she actually just sent me uh, my son's at bat because she's at a baseball tournament right now. So you, it, does, it, it does matter. It's super important because he's one of those guys that I got in proximity. But it has nothing to do with the fact that she was watching. So I got my hopes up. <laughs> this doesn't happen like just by chance. Because if I were to ask for a show of hands of who's doing it, I don't think there'd be a ton. We've got a purpose to do it. What's the next one, please? Mission. One of the greatest ways for us to have empowering relationships is for us to have a shared mission. If, if, if we're not doing something together, it's really hard for us to, to kind of gain traction in forward gospel movement. Jesus was always doing stuff together. He was with them a lot. He ate, he broke bread, he hung out, but, but they were moving forward together. This is a key component of empowering relationships, that you have a shared mission that you're working on together. 
Next one is belief. Belief. Having somebody believe in you is like crazy empowering. Having somebody who believes in you before you believe in yourself can absolutely change your life. That's an element of empowering relationships. It leads to the next one, permission. Permission. Paul gave Timothy a ton of permission. And when you give people permission, they're going to mess it up. You're going to find yourself in situations that are messier than they were before you started. But that's where you get to see the gospel come to life in both success and failure. I need permission to be disruptive because my heart will always take me back to my 15-year-old self who is just consumed with what everyone thinks of me. And when I start pastoring you like that, and when I start uh, like fathering and I'm a husband like that, I am not disruptive. I am a great rule follower. As a matter of fact, I crushed the rules for years. And I want a lot of people's affections. It's just so hard to keep them. And I miss Jesus in that. I got you, and you guys are awesome. But you're not Jesus. And and I don't mean you, the Avenue Church. I mean just people. I got people to say, yes, well done, good boy. Way to, way to do what everyone expected you to do. I need somebody to come and give me permission to be as disruptive as the gospel calls me to be. So do you. I think we have one more. Nope, we don't. Good for you, because we're running out of time. Here's our, here's our last fill in the blank. This is where we'll finish and we'll, we're going to go out and do some baptisms. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fill in the blank, right? And so we kind of had this term thrown around and I thought it was really appropriate. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, a culture of empowerment has an identified bench. Has an identified bench. Like if I were to ask you, remember, like we're, we're giving this away. Who's on your bench? Do you have an identified two or three people that, that you've prayed about and you feel like the Lord's put in your life so that you are, you're not giving this away? Who, who is it that's on your bench that you're able to now walk in some of these aspects toward as we look to see this greater empowerment? Jesus said, go out and make disciples. Go out and make disciples. And as you make disciples, the idea is that they're going to make disciples. And I'm going to ask those people who are getting baptized, would you guys come up here to this table, please? Just come on up right here. It's about to get public, so can we give them a hand, please? I could have just done this and we could have been done. I know it's the best part right here. But who, who's it going to be? Who's going to empower this generation of, of new believers that want to run hard after Jesus? I'm not saying that like as a cool slogan to put on. I'm talking about like who. I'm wondering, Holy Spirit, I pray that you come and fill us right now and just speak to individuals out there right now as you look this way. I'm just asking God's spirit to, as you look at them, as you see what's about to happen, maybe God puts one or two of them on your heart where you go up and you congratulate and you say, hey, man, can, we, can we grab a cup of coffee? Can I just hear more of your story? Because maybe you've got margin or maybe you need to make margin. Because they are a, they're a new believer in Christ. They're ready to follow Christ. But a disciple is somebody, if you read the passage, who learns to obey the teachings of Christ. There is a whole new life that they have just entered into that they are going to need a Dan Myers for. They are going to need a Paul for. And so, man, I'm just curious, and I'm praying, and I'm hoping that the Lord 
puts that on some of your hearts today. We'll end with this quote from Pastor John Ortberg. Let all small thoughts of gospel ministry be put out of our minds. Let all small thoughts of their new life in Christ be put out of your mind. There is nothing small that God wants to accomplish through you. Today we publicly celebrate that you are placing your allegiance with Jesus at great cost to yourself because he first placed his allegiance to you through his death and resurrection. Do you all affirm that? Is that your affirmation? That you are ready at great cost to yourself to be allegiant to Jesus because he was first allegiant to you. This today is somewhat of like a wedding day. It's like a day where they're saying, I'm joining Jesus and he's joining me. We're in it together forever. And like any good marriage, there's a year seven coming and there's children coming and there's disciples that they'll make and there's all sorts of things that are coming. And you know that it takes a community of Christ to raise a flourishing marriage. And the same is gonna be true of these people right here. Let no small thoughts of your new life in Christ be in your minds today it would do a disservice to the Jesus that you pledge your allegiance to to think that you are going to live a normal, expected, average life. You are not to be compliant. You are not to follow the expectations of others. You are not to give yourself to the approval of anyone but Jesus Christ. And as you do, I just proclaim gospel disruption over all of you that the world would be changed specifically through this crew we baptize today. Amen? So I'm going to pray over them. If you have children and kingdom kids, we'd ask that you'd be dismissed to get them and come back. Please don't leave. Like You don't want to miss this. It's their wedding. That'd be so rude. You don't want to miss that. So we're going we're gonna to come out. The, the, the baptism tank is right out there. We're just going to surround it, and we're going to let all of Delray know that like God is still very much on the move in bringing people who are spiritually dead to spiritual life. Father, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit in this moment, that you would give us a great spirit of celebration, that as we baptize them into the water, they would come out, and it would be reflective of their sins being washed away in the newness they have because of your righteousness and faith therein. Lord, give them a spirit of disruption that brings your love and your power and your self-control, that brings your gospel ministry to the world around them and beyond. In Christ's name, amen and amen. We'll see you out there, guys.